All right, hello everyone, and welcome to this um, Ritzy and Shorendi webinar on how to write your novel's blurb and refine its opening pages. So just warning, we're having few technical uh, problems with one of our uh, mics for our editor Katie. So uh, we'll try to solve those as we go through the presentation. In the meantime, you can already uh, leave your questions on YouTube and I'll we'll take a look at them uh, um, at the end. So for those who don't know me, I'm Ricardo Faye. I'm one of the founders at Ritzy.com. Um, and you can find me on Twitter at Ricardo Fayette. And I'm joined today by um, a great panel. Uh, so we have two editors from the Ritzy Marketplace, Rebecca Heyman and Katie McCoach, who specialize in developmental editing. And we have a Ritzy marketer, uh, Brie Weber. So I thought to talk about blurbs and opening pages, it's both about craft, so writing a good blurb. It's also about marketing, how to write a blurb that's going to resonate with uh, the right readers, how to optimize it for Amazon, and how to basically get more readers to read it, finish it, be intrigued, and open the, the first few pages. So now this webinar is brought to all of us by Shorendi, and we have uh, Sion from Shorendi who can tell us a bit more about the cool stuff they're doing. Thanks, Ricardo. Hi, everyone. I'm Sion Ashleman, creator of the Shore Indie Contest and a member of its editing team. And I just want to tell you a little bit about the contest. It supports emerging indie authors by removing barriers to producing and publishing quality books and by providing resources needed for a successful indie author career. In this contest, 10 talented authors will be chosen to work with a professional editor for free for seven weeks before competing for the grand prize and runner-up prize packages, which contain resources they will need to finish producing a high-quality book, market their book effectively, and further their learning about craft and indie authorship. Submissions open June 3rd to 5th. To learn more, please visit sureindie.blogspot.com. And I'm incredibly excited about because it's a great example of the kind of learning about craft and indie authorship that's at the core of this contest's mission. So thank you so much, Ricardo, for putting this together for us. No, it's been my pleasure. And I think, uh, I mean, there are a lot of contests out there for traditional publishing, like pitch publication or their pitch contests. So it's great to see one uh, for indie authors and that aims to, to bring them the kind of um, professional level and expertise that um, traditionally published authors uh, usually have access to. So I'm excited to see how it goes and to support Trinity however, however we can. Thanks. Yeah, that's exactly what we thought too. We're excited. Awesome. So I don't know, Katie, if you've been able to figure out the sound. If you have, feel free to kind of jump in the conversation. Um, otherwise, I'll just keep going. So the idea for this webinar is that all of you uh, authors usually put a lot of effort into writing and then revising and then revising and then revising your novel. Um, so when time comes to write the blurb, I see a lot of authors who really face the struggle of how can I sum up my whole novel into just a few lines uh, and lines that are going to be totally crucial to actually selling my book. So there's a lot of anxiety around writing the blurb, a lot of people who are amazing writers and are great at writing a novel are very, very bad at writing just a small blurb to, re to define that novel and to intrigue readers. So it, there's, really, there's really an art to it, an art that's similar to writing um, a query letter for to pitch agents. Um, and that's what we're going to be talking today. So on the one hand, we're going to see how to write a strong blurb, what kind of mistakes and hurdles you need to avoid. Uh, how you need to optimize your blurb and your metadata to kind of make your book more easily findable on Amazon. And then we're also going to see something really, I think, really interesting is like different split testing options um, to kind of test different blurbs because I'm sure all of you have written and rewritten your blurb several times and comes a point where you, you can't really know which version's the best one. So there are ways to split test them. And then we'll go into the opening pages of your manuscript, because when people have read your blurb, 
uh, on Amazon, often they're going to take a look inside the book with Amazon's look inside feature and then read your opening pages. And so not only does your blurb need to grab the readers, the opening pages need to really hook them in and get them to purchase the book. So we'll also see how you can revise these, those opening uh, pages to avoid cliches and um, to really hook the readers in. So I'll start, um, as I usually like to start in Read C webinars, is by asking our panels for the most common mistakes that they've seen out there in their career uh, when it comes to the topic at hand, which is blurbs. So um, Rebecca, do you want to start? You're saying that either blurbs are too way too long and detailed or they're too short and wholly reliant on cliches. Yeah, I think that's um, two of the biggest mistakes I see. Um, We'll get into this a little bit later, but those opening lines of your blurb have to be incredibly precise and dynamic. And I think there's an instinct for a lot of first time authors to make sure the readers understand everything before the beginning. And that's generally a mistake. So, um, you know, making sure that the blurb is dynamic and really accentuates conflict in a specific way without providing every iota of backstory that has contributed to that conflict is a really smart choice. That makes sense. And we'll go more um, in the slide right after uh, on what makes actually a strong blurb. Uh, by the way, um, you can take notes for those of you watching it, but I'll make the, the slides available together with the replay afterwards. So you, if you don't want to take notes, you don't need to. Uh, now, Bree, thanks for, for joining us. Uh, you're saying that Two most common mistakes are writing a summary of the plot instead of a pitch for the book or writing in a different voice that doesn't match the book or genre. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, thanks for having me. I think uh, Rebecca really kind of hit it right on the head there. A lot of the times I see authors who are sort of writing a long plot summary rather than kind of summarizing what's going to grab a reader's attention or call out to elements of the genre that readers are looking for in their next read. So it tends to be kind of a long and detailed uh, description of every plot point or, or character introduction. And what you're really looking to do is grab the reader's attention to say, this book is part of this genre. Here are some of the elements that you're going to find in the book and then give them a reason to, to look inside and check out those first couple pages and start reading. Cool. Uh, now the the hour of the truth comes. Uh, Katie, have you been able to figure out the the sound? Apparently not. Um, all right, we'll improvise on this one. Uh, Sion, do you want to jump in and give your most common blur mistakes? Uh, <laughs> I'm I'm feeling um, embarrassed and a little bit on, on the spot because I definitely did not prepare for this because um, I was hoping that Katie could get her sound working. Um, yeah, I I I agree with what um, Becca and Bree have both said, especially Becca's point about providing too much backstory before you talk about the conflict, um, and that's definitely one of the things that I. Uh, see in terms of most common mistakes on the blurbs and also um, making it too long and having it be more of a plot summary rather than a hook. Cool. Uh, so now we've seen kind of the mistakes and the things you shouldn't do in your blurb. Uh, we're going to look at what you should have and shouldn't have in it. So what you shouldn't have is pretty much ending uh, what you shouldn't have yet is endings, obviously, the ending of your story, or spoilers. Uh, so the blurb should intrigue the reader, but not really all the whole story. You shouldn't include the uh, subplots, as Rebecca mentioned. And you also shouldn't go into metaphysical or emotional journeys. So um, Rebecca, do you want to go a little bit more into that as well? Sure. Um, you know, a blurb is about enticement. It's kind of like the aroma of a really delicious meal, right? It's the thing that really um, draws us to the table and makes us want to sit down and, and see what's going to come next and dig in. So um, with that in mind, you know, uh, you don't want to um, kind of spoil everyone's palate, right, by giving them the ending before the beginning. There's a reason why you eat dessert last. 
Um, similarly with subplots, right? Like if I tell you that um, you're going to have, you know, steak and potatoes for dinner, I don't necessarily go into detail about how much salt I used and this special way that I sort of reduce the glaze, uh, you know, with fresh herbs. None of that is as important as this core idea of steak and potatoes, right? So uh, I know what I'm getting with that brief description um, without getting bogged down in details. And then as far as metaphysical or emotional journeys go, um, they are, are just not super compelling. I know that this pains a lot of authors who are very attached to their characters' internal worlds, but you can't ask people to care about your character's inner life before we care about your character's external life. Uh, and external lives have to do with conflicts in time and space, not internal conflicts about, you know, will my character find true love or find happiness, even in romance um, or even in literary fiction where those themes are very present. Uh, we still need to have a really good sense of external conflict and the stakes before we can start to get invested in what's happening for um, the interior environment of your main character. That makes sense. And the stakes is also something that, that Katie mentioned a lot um, in, in her answers to me when I asked what authors should include in their blurb. Um, Katie, at any point, feel free to jump in just to let me know that you figured this out and that you can talk to us now. Um, otherwise, if anyone wants to say anything else around what you should include in your blurb, just go ahead. Uh, yeah, I, I do have a couple things to add to that. Um, uh, everything that Becca said, obviously. And I also think that it's important to highlight in your blurb, uh, in a subtle way, the ways in which your, your book is both familiar, meaning it contains elements that readers are already familiar with and are excited about, and also highlights what's unique about this book. And um, And another thing to think about is including in the blurb some key words that clue readers in to the genre that this book is. Absolutely, and we'll go into keywords and key phrases in just a moment. So now a few tips for, for writing a strong, uh, a strong blurb. Um, we'll start with, uh, with Brie on this one. Uh, so you're saying, do your research, look at what the competition uh, is doing, think like a reader, so think from a reader's perspective, what are readers searching for and what are they hoping uh, to read when they come on your, on your book page and avoid cliches and use hyperbole instead. So hyperbole is something that comes again and again um, when if, you, if you've done some reading around um, book blurbs and how to write them. Sabri? Yeah, so actually one of my favorite examples of a really well put together uh, blurb, especially in terms of opening lines, is actually book number one from the Twilight series. And it's actually become pretty popular because it was used in the movie, but the first lines of that blurb are, and I'm paraphrasing here, are, you know, there are three things that I know about Edward Cullen. One, that he's a vampire. Two, that he thirsts for my blood. And three, that uh, Bella's in love with him. And that tells the reader right away what the genre is. It's it's paranormal. It's romance. It gives a sense of what that, you know, primary conflict is in terms of is he going to kill her or are they going to live happily ever after? And it doesn't jump into any of that and any of the subplots in terms of high school issues or, you know, who's going to be attacking them later. So it just gives you a sense of that primary contact. Uh, conflict that's happening. There aren't really any cliches going on, but there is a sense of hyperbole in terms of the language that's used that, you know, absolutely positive in the sense of um, direness that's coming into play. So I think that's a really strong blurb. And it, in terms of what competitors are doing, uh, one of the big things that we see, especially in genre fiction, is just kind of a listing out of perspectives from you know, protagonist one versus protagonist two, if they're seeing different experiences happening in the book, and then listing out those individual lines of um, here's an issue, here's another issue, and here's how it's going to come to play. So then it's left in the hands of the reader to decide if this is the book they're searching for and if they're going to read it ultimately. 
Yes, and I think as with anything else, when it comes to kind of marketing a book or preparing a book for publication, you need to just have a browse through other books in your genre on Amazon, whether it's for the cover or for the blurb, take a look at what other successful authors are done, how they phrase their first sentence, uh, what kind of elements appear in their blurb, and not copy them, but try and, try and take some inspiration from them um, to craft yours. So now, Rebecca, you say um, you said we should focus on the on the main character's movement through actual time and space, as opposed to we mentioned it before, kind of metaphysical or emotional journeys, right? Yeah, um, you know, I think I can't, um, you know, cheer enough for, for what Bree just said. And I think, um, you know, really framing the, the stakes of your primary conflict uh, has to be priority number one for a blurb. And with that in mind, uh, I, would, I would make the case that um, your, your primary conflict has to exist in the physical world of your manuscript. So um, that's not to say that, that character arcs are not a critical part of what makes a plot dynamic, but they're certainly not going to um, hook most readers. Um, so I think even when we're thinking about the most meta book possible, right? If we're talking about, let's say, metamorphosis, right? Where the, the, the whole thing is just this big analogy for the human condition and there's so much happening. Ostensibly, we still have a guy who wakes up as a bug. So this is like a real world thing that is happening in his physical reality. And that's really important. So, um, you know, just avoid avoid that instinct to reveal your character's deepest soul in your blur because I don't think any reader really cares about that uh, before they're invested in the primary stakes of your novel. That makes sense. So there we go. Tips for writing a strong blurb. Uh, and sorry for the shuffling of windows. Um, just trying to see if Katie can join. But otherwise, um, Sion, do you want to step in again? Uh, now you're prepared because you know I'm going to do this every time. <laughs> yeah, I'm starting to get used to the idea. Um, yeah, I would, I would love to. Uh, just to reinforce uh, both what I heard uh, Bree say, what's on this slide here, and what you said, Ricardo, um, in terms of looking at others' uh, back copy blurbs to get some inspiration for your own. Um, learning, how to, learning how to read for craft is such a useful skill to have as a writer and that actually applies to marketing copy as well so this particular instance of writing the back cover blurb um, and I think it's particularly useful to pay attention to what appeals to you as a reader like when you look at a back cover copy that really grabs you um, if you if you've bought any books recently because you read the back cover copy and you're like yeah this sounds amazing take a minute to go back and look at those and really analyze that back cover copy to see what they're doing in terms of presenting the elements that we've been talking about, what they reveal and what they don't reveal, and how they might um, include words that key you into, again, the both the familiar and the unique elements, and that cue you in is, as to what um, genre the book is. Absolutely. So take, take a strong look at the competition, let's say. Um, and I guess, uh, to emphasize Katie's, Katie's point on this slide, um, there are a lot of articles out there on how to write a strong blur, but there are even more on how to write query letters. And they're not the exact same thing, but you can learn a lot from these articles as well, because um, pitching a book to an agent is akin to pitching a book to a reader, which is what you're doing in the blurb. So have a read, even if you're not going to write a query letter or query agents or pursue traditional publishing, take a look at this, uh, and these blog posts on query letters because they're going to be helpful to write the blurb of the book. So now we're going to talk more uh, and focusing on, on, on Bree's advice on how to optimize the blurb for Amazon. So we've got a professional marketer, um, book marketer on this call. So if while she's talking about these uh, things, uh, you have any questions? Drop them uh, next to the um, next to the chat here on YouTube, and we'll get to them right after the the webinar. Uh, so, Bree, do you want to tell us a little bit more about the importance of this first sentence? 
kind of added a screenshot to highlight it. Yeah, this is perfect. So as you can see on the screen, you have a limited amount of real estate to capture some, someone's attention. And from there, you're relying on the reader or prospective buyer to engage and click read more in order to find out uh, a little bit more about the book and the primary conflict and the sort of physical space that your book is going to be dealing in. So that first line, um, you can see in, in Mark Dawson's example, he has that bold in. So using HTML formatting, and there are a number of resources that come directly from Amazon as well as some other blogs and articles that talk about how to incorporate HTML elements and tags into your book description. But it's a really great way to capture someone's attention and get them to start reading. Another really useful tip is, uh, especially as you're getting great reviews, whether they're editorial reviews or reader reviews from Amazon or Goodreads or elsewhere, to uh, add those into your description because reviews serve basically as a word of mouth recommendation. So if you can see that so-and-so loved the book or if a reader is comparing it to another author, that's always very helpful to see what this is similar to and then how it's going to be different based on how you're positioning the book. All of that information in that first line and really that first paragraph is going to be what encourages a potential reader to click more, to look inside, and then to buy your book. Absolutely. And yeah, I think the, the screenshot kind of uh, speaks for itself. I've, I've done a bit of uh, searching through Amazon, for example, and most of the best sellers I've seen in their different categories had a bolded first line like that. Uh, so it's something that seems to be working for a lot of people and kind of uh, becoming more and more standard practice. So take advantage of it. It really does stand out next to next to the title. And uh, I think it kind of helps hook readers in. And as you uh, read so through that description, sorry, Mark included a number of keywords that will help the book show up in more searches. If you, you read through, there's British government, there's assassin, there's missing scientist. These are generally themes that are often found in his genre. So he's capitalizing on those potential keyword searches to make sure that they are uh, showing up in his first paragraph so that he's going to appear higher up in more Amazon searches. Absolutely. And the book's actually been picked, I think, this Friday as a Kindle single by uh, Amazon and getting a lot of promotion through it. And it's for a good cause as well. Um, so take a look at the book, by the way, if you read thrillers, it's a good one. Uh, there you go, Mark. Publicity for you. Um, so you mentioned kind of wine line reviews. So I've found another example in another book. Uh, I think it's Blood Rush by Ben Galley. Um, so we've discussed this already, so we kind of go a bit quicker on it. Uh, but any kind of reviews you get that are that mean something, so a best-selling author in your genre, uh, someone your readers will um, identify, or a review outlet, a famous review outlet, or a really good review even, you can add these as kind of editorial reviews within uh, your blurb. Um, do you think that's a good practice, Bree, or do you think that's something people should avoid more. Yeah, I do think it's a good practice. And I think we'll talk a little bit later about sort of testing blurbs to see what's going to get the most traction. So definitely testing out, adding in reviews, author blurbs from uh, authors who are in your genre, especially those who might have a, a established audience and, you, and you're still looking to grow yours, having a name on like that that you can add to your book blurb can be extremely helpful. And uh, generally, I would recommend to prioritize editorial review or publication outlets that have highly praised your book ahead of reader reviews, simply because they are generally held in esteem to be a good sense of whether or not the book is um, true to the blurb that you've written. Absolutely. And there are a number of ways to get editorial reviews uh, for free from from good review from yeah almost famous review outlets. So we've got a free course on that part of Read C Learning called Book Reviews. So if you Google Read C Learning Book Reviews, you should find the course. Uh, it was written by Amy Edelman, who heads Indie Reader, a paid review outlet, but who's going to explain how to get free reviews from free review outlets. Um, now, 
we talked about keywords. So um, re you already mentioned this. Try to include keywords uh, in your in your blurb now. I've added my own advice in there as well because often I see authors confused about this kind of add keywords to your blurb advice and I see authors just stuffing the blurb full of keywords just hoping that Amazon will show their book um, higher down. So I don't know if you've come across that or not before. Yeah, so because Amazon, like really any search engine, is looking for quality content or authoritative content, there is an element of penalization if they feel that the description is sort of spamming the system. This is pretty much true of any search engine. So you do want to ensure that all of the keywords and information and phrases that you're included, including in your book blurb, are really relevant to the story and not just you know a list of keywords. Uh, Amazon does have a section to include keywords that you can use to help increase the number of categories or subgenre that your book shows up in and they have uh, listed in their author resources section on Amazon where you can go through and find you know if you're a romance author and you want to be listed um, under character types or setting types you can add those keywords either in the keyword section or in the book description. So I generally recommend to include those keywords very naturally in your language to describe the setting, character types, the tropes that come up, any themes that are relevant, and just sort of general story tones so that Amazon recognizes those keywords and doesn't penalize you for trying to gain the system. Yeah, absolutely. I think the, the word here is kind of natural. I think this this should come natural. You, sh you should think about keywords, but they should also come natural in your blur because if you're if you've written a book for, for a particular market, and when you're going to describe your book, you should naturally use words, keywords that are going to be of interest to that market. So uh, I think, yeah, Mark Dawson was a, was a great uh, example with espionage, uh, British government, uh, maybe thriller immediately in the first paragraph, and they come across pretty naturally. So they're going to they're going to help Amazon identify the book as an espionage thriller around the British government. Uh, but obviously it doesn't start, the blurb doesn't start with thriller, espionage, British government agent. <laughs> right. Exactly. So Can I jump in with a question really quick. Absolutely. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm curious, and this is a tiny bit outside what we've been talking about because we've been talking about blurbs, but I've seen um, people using the titles. They, ha they end up having really long titles or they have really long um, series names that include keywords in them. And I was wondering if you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, definitely. So I have seen both cases where um, sort of stuffing titles or subtitles or even series descriptions with those keywords works really well and I've seen it where you get penalized and unfortunately it's, it's really difficult to know which way it'll go simply because Amazon uses a ghost algorithm that they don't share with us. So in many cases it can definitely help increase where you sit in the standings and where you show up and, and the number of searches as well as your placement in those searches. Um, but I've also seen authors who have had their accounts closed or canceled because it's technically against terms. So, and it's something that Amazon um, recommends that you do not do, but the authors who sort of uh, go under um, the Amazon's eye, so to speak, and are able to get through have had pretty tremendous success. So you you are gambling with your career in a sense, but so it's generally, I would say that's a personal decision. I recommend against it simply because the authors that I work with are looking to build a writing career and Amazon is a big player in that. So you do need to play by the rules to some extent. Yeah. I have well, another question. Can yeah, I ask, Bri, you're doing such a great job. So, um, <laughs> So one of the things that we often tell people who are querying traditionally is that they can say a lot for their pitch by using an X me to Y comp. So I might say something like um, alien meets breakfast club in my young adult, 
you know, whatever. And then I continue to talk about, obviously, how aliens are invading a high school where a group of misfits are in detention together. So I'm wondering if a similar strategy might be beneficial in a blurb um, for something self-published to establish some of those sort of keyword ideas, but by using a comp title instead. Is that something you recommend? Yeah, so again, to an extent. So just like issues with uh, stuffing keywords into titles or subtitles, Amazon really dislikes when you list competitive authors or titles in the book description section because they want to handle that part on their own in terms of recommending similar books or similar authors. So um, with that said, I do typically recommend some form of that where you're introducing, you know, this book is, um, you know, high school meets outer space or core concepts rather than specific titles or specific comp authors. Again, what's really helpful is if you have a review who's making that statement for you, you don't get penalized. So if you have a reader or um, an editorial review who's made that connection on your behalf, then yes, run with that. Um, but generally, if you stick to those core concepts, you can achieve some of that same effect. Yeah, and something uh, we haven't included in this webinar is actually Amazon's policies on Blurb. So, uh, we've touched a little bit on it regarding uh, comp titles or other authors in your genre. Um, but in general, have a look through Amazon's official policies for blurbs. I think you're also not allowed to state that you're a best-selling author if you actually aren't a best-selling author. So if you haven't had one of your books on the top of one of Amazon's categories, which is fairly easy nowadays, but uh, still, if you haven't achieved that, uh, don't write it. Don't write that you're a New York Times bestselling author if you haven't been on the New York Times bestsellers list. Um, basically, don't claim anything that you aren't uh, able to demonstrate. Uh, and have a look at Amazon's official policies regarding uh, regarding blurbs. Now, to give my opinion on the um, on keyword stuffing titles and making them really long, I'd warn against it uh, for two reasons. Well, for, for no, for one main reason, it's that, as Bree mentioned, Amazon's a search engine. Um, it's a search engine that's relatively newer than Google, for example. And it's in the nature of search engines to kind of refine their algorithms to, con to try to find the people who are gaming the algorithm. And making a title very long and full of keywords really feels like gaming the algorithm, because it's not about good content. It's just about finding a way to kind of play with the algorithm so that they show your book higher. So whether Amazon penalizes it today or not, they're going to probably penalize it or find a way to uh, penalize it in a few years. So don't try to game any kind of advice you find online on the internet on ways you can uh, that, that seem a little bit fishy. <coughs> so don't, don't follow it. Yeah? Um, now, we're going to go into split testing different versions of your blurb. Um, so that's the question I ask Brie, because a lot of times I think uh, we write different versions of the blurb. We write it once, then the second time, and the third time, and we don't know which one's the best one. So I know a lot of authors then just like head to their favorite Facebook group and post which blurb you prefer. That's not necessarily the best place to ask because the people who are in that Facebook group are generally other authors, not necessarily readers of their genre, and who are going to give their own opinions that don't really matter. So who should we be asking, Bree? OK, so I do think that starting with if you have beta readers or early reviewers who are uh, regular readers of your genre and are familiar with your comp authors and comp titles, that's generally the first place I recommend starting simply because you can get a really good sense of, especially if they've read the book, if this is actually true, what the sort of main elements, the character conflict and things like that that you're pulling out, if that's really where your kind of your hook really lies. So getting that feedback from your beta readers is extremely helpful. One thing I often recommend authors do, and this is uh, probably similar if they were to approach a traditional publisher and agent is to do an outline of their book. And by outline, I don't necessarily mean when you're writing an outline, but just um, 
a comprehensive summary of all of the plot points and character arcs in your book so that you have a template to go back to when you're split testing and say, you know, this element isn't quite working and then you can draw from another main point in your book. Because the next place I recommend going is, you know, talk to your editor, talk to your author team. If you're working with a marketer, if you're working with, um, you know, your website, developer, anyone who is helping to create your author platform, develop your brand, prepare your books for publication. They've worked in that genre most likely quite a bit and can provide some objective feedback in terms of what works and what they've seen that doesn't work quite so well. Um, and you mentioned uh, Facebook groups. If you are part of reader groups or author groups, that can be really helpful, but sometimes it's nice to get an objective reading and that's something that you can do with some of those uh, survey uh, type forms, whether you post it on social media or you try out uh, uh, an objective one where you never meet or converse with the recipients or respondents to your survey. And then the final two recommendations, and this is a little bit more um, of a gamble, is to sort of A-B test with your email list. If you have campaigns going out, you can uh, test out your current readers to see who's going to respond to those book announcements with different book blurbs and get a sense of what your fans are, are looking for and what your readers are interested in. And the same goes with Facebook ads. Obviously the cost there is quite a bit higher, so that might come down to the nitty gritty details when you're ready for that. Yeah, no, and I'd say, so I added the Facebook ads, I'd say it's more to be tests, uh, maybe the first sentence in your blurb, um, the decisive one, because you, you spend a bit of money on that and you see which, which one gets the highest click through rate um, next to your cover. Um, same for, for the email list, uh, compare open rates and click rates as well. Uh, so open rate is gonna judge how effective your subject line is and click rate is gonna judge how effective your email copy uh, is. Exactly. So a bunch of different ways to kind of A-B test your blurb. Any questions, Rebecca or Sion? No, all right, we'll move on. Um, cool, so now we're moving on to the opening pages of the novel. And again, uh, as we did for the blurb, we'll start with how not to start a novel. Uh, so a bunch of these bullet points were contributed by, um, by, Re by Rebecca, uh, some of them from Katie. Um, so Rebecca, I'll let you start and then we'll get Sion's uh, advice as well. Um, first of all, we, we may have solved it. Katie, do you want to test out your mic right now? Unmute yourself and, and see if you're working. Are you working? Sure. Can you hear me? Hallelujah, we can hear you. <laughs> Yay! Um, so I'm going to be super brief because I know that you probably all want to hear from Katie and have heard me too much. So um, I'm going to skip around this list a little bit to, to note the ones that I uh, remember mentioning to Ricardo. Um, so look, here's the thing about your character waking up. Nobody cares. Everybody wakes up unless they're dead. So starting a novel with your character waking up is just as boring as plain sliced bread. So stop doing it. I keep reading about people waking up and the author will say, right, but, but, um, but this is from a nightmare though. And to that I say, no one cares. Or they'll say, well, it's not really waking up because they were in a coma before. So it's different. And again, I implore you, don't do it. If your character has to open their eyes and come vertical from horizontal, that is called waking up and nobody wants to read about it. So you can just rip those pages out and throw them in a bonfire. Um, another problem that I see frequently is um, characters who, after waking up, right, we get them in the morning so we don't actually see them get out of bed so authors think that they're avoiding the cliche, but then they take some time to stare in a mirror and talk about their smoky gray eyes and their five o'clock shadow. Um, and this is also not how you interact with yourself in the real world. Uh, so it's not how your character should interact with himself in his world either. So long catalogs of physical attributes, you can nix those as well. Uh, the last one I'll mention before I kick it over to Katie is um, dead bodies. So 
uh, there's this notion that you need an inciting action quite quickly. This is 100% true. But for many uh, authors, that means somebody dies right away, and that's okay. But um, you can't expect readers to inherently care about a dead body just because it's dead. So you have to give us a reason to invest emotionally in the immediate experience of either um, the dead person or the person investigating the crime or the person who has committed the crime. So, um, you know, while it can be quite shocking to you know, put your narrative perspective inside a character who then dies at the end of chapter one, say, uh, you know, that's one of the only ways where I'm really going to be able to invest heavily in, um, in a dead body right away, right? Or unless I understand that this uh, deceased person has some um, significance to my protagonist. So if my protagonist is attending a funeral, but it's for someone like a parent, well, then there's a certain emotional immediacy to that death that I can understand, that as a reader, I can understand right away. So uh, I would just caution you against, um, you know, believing in the interest of a dead body just for a dead body's sake. It's not inherently interesting unless we're emotionally invested. And now I happily kick it over uh, to Katie McCoach. Hi everyone. So glad this finally works. <laughs> um, sorry for missing so much of it. Um, so to go on from what Rebecca said, um, kind of along the lines of a dead body is kind of why you wouldn't want to start with dialogue. I mean, there are exceptions to this rule, but if you start immediately with a conversation and no one knows who these characters are, they just, no one's going to care about it. They don't know, they're not invested in why this conversation is happening. And like I said, there are exceptions, but for the most part, I would just not start with dialogue or internal monologue because we need to know where we are. We kind of want to ground our readers in the scene first. Um, introduce them to who this person is, give them some sort of voice in the way they see the world, um, and set up our readers to see why we should care and keep reading the story before we go into talking about their life. Um, another thing is, weather is a cliche, you know, we see that all the time. It, it was popular for a long time, and so now it's been overdone, as so many things that started so well have, you know, they've become cliche over time. So I would just say weather, just don't do it. Um, if you really wanted to, I mean, I would talk to many editors before you decide to move forward with starting with weather. And overloading with backstory or um, immediately backtracking are the other things that I listed here because uh, backtracking is one of those things when I start reading a, the first pages of a book and we're like right in the scene and it's active and everything's happening and it's very exciting and then they're, they, the character goes back and says, oh, you know, all these things just happened a few moments ago. Well, why didn't you just start the story then? You know, if those things were important, start it where it's important. Don't take us backwards because now we're time jumping and it's going to be hard for, care, uh, for readers to keep moving forward. They just want to be in the present and move forward with your characters. Um, and then backstory is kind of the same. It can dull the scene. Um, it'll just slow everything down if you just give us all of the stuff that happened, you know, that we should know about the character that we don't actually need to know. So some of the stuff is, you know, who they are, um, like, I don't know, their occupation, um, that their first job. You know, if you started with all these things that took them to the spot in their life without just showing us who they are right now in their life, you're going to just slow down the scene. I'm sorry, my cat is walking, about to walk on the computer. <laughs> um, so I would just say backstory is really tough, and a lot of people tend to do it um, all the time. And so I would get a lot of readers, definitely editors, to point out your backstory if you struggle to even know when you're doing it. Um, because it's just, it's so important to not slow down. I mean, that's the thing. With opening pages, you just don't want to slow down the story. Okay, I'm done. Cool. And we've got three editors on the call, and two of them have a cat right next to them. Um, so that's pretty cool. So now tips for refining your novel's opening. So we went over what you shouldn't do. Uh, and now we'll do, we'll go over what, 
how at least you can refine your uh, your novel opening to make it uh, stronger. So again, uh, Rebecca, Brie, Katie, and we'll start with uh, Rebecca. Um, so a lot of the quotes um, on this page are uh, sort of reiterative of things that we've said. So I want to talk a little bit about um, what you should be doing at the beginning of a novel. There's always a lot of talk about the don'ts. So um, I want to talk about discernible action. Uh, discernible action, I hate to be a broken record, but it's actual movement through time and space. Um, so establishing your character in their world, whether that's what we understand as reality or some alternate universe. Um, you know, Katie made the great point that starting with weather is, is generally a cliche. And of course, it was a dark and stormy night is the paragon of cliched phrases. Um, thinking about film for a moment, um, if you've seen the movie Unfaithful with Diane Lane, it starts it, during the opening credits. We see these huge gales just like blowing so hard through the countryside and then uh, into the city. And this is, um, these represent the winds of change, right? And this is something that you can look for in films all the time. So we want our, our environment, our external environment to reflect a character's interior circumstances, but we don't want to be heavy handed about it and we don't want it to be overly obvious. And of course, environment is not just weather, right? So um, where is your character? What are they doing there? Um, are they in danger? Are they doing something uh, they shouldn't be doing? You know, um, setting is about time, place, and space. And so I encourage you to really take a sensory view of where your character is when we meet them. Uh, Diana Gabaldon, of course, famed author of the Outlander series, has a rule of three. She says if you incorporate three of the five uh, senses in any given scene, you will sort of activate the um, immediacy of the physical space in that scene. She has um, a beautiful book actually about the relevance of the rule of three to love scenes called I Give You My Body. And I recommend that as reading for anybody, even those people who are not writing romance, because it, she really beautifully articulates how to incorporate um, your character's environment into tension, emotional immediacy, uh, and character depth. So I would say when you open that novel, just make sure that you're aware of your character surroundings, they're dynamic, um, and that you're giving us a really nice sense of voice. Um, Ricardo's gonna put up a couple samples of novel openings shortly, and uh, I have one on that slide uh, with a great, great uh, example for all of you about exactly that. Awesome. Brie, you want to give your tips? Yeah, so this is going to be a slightly different approach because in some ways marketing often feels like you're approaching it backwards because you want to kind of think of it from the reader's perspective. So you have written your book, you're working with your editor, you're finalizing and getting to the production stage. And when you start working with an editor is generally when you want to start working on some of that marketing material because one of the worst things that can happen is when a potential reader goes to Amazon or your book page, they're getting really excited about your cover. It looks great. You have a wonderful book blurb that's, you know, captured their attention. They go to the look inside or they open your book on a shelf and the emotions that you've sparked or the interest that you've caught in your book blurb, it's not in those first 10 you know, pages or in that first chapter or two. And that can really be a big turnoff because if a reader is going to invest their time, they want to know that um, they're getting um, the promise that, that you've made to them. So although the book and the writing definitely comes first. You want to create the story that you intended. I do highly recommend that you take a cursory glance and kind of look at those initial pages, or those initial chapters from a marketing perspective before you finalize that book because you want to make sure that from a reader perspective or from a book retailer perspective or a book buyer perspective, that you are uh, delivering on those promises in terms of back cover copy to those first couple of pages. Awesome, and Katie? Um, yeah, I kind of touched on this in the last slide, um, the things that we do want, and so I'll keep it kind of quick, but 
like I said, we want to start in the right place. Um, we want to make sure that uh, we're keeping it active um, in a way that we're able to just keep moving forward with the scene um, and not slowing it down or we don't want to start, like Rebecca said, we don't want to start waking up if the action is really, you know, when they got into an accident on the way to school or something. Like if that's the important part of the story, then start there. Um, we don't need to see everything that leads up to it um, unless it truly plays into setting up who this person is. You know, if there was a conversation they had with their parent and they got in a huge fight and then they got in an accident, then that's something that could really contribute to the story. But if we're just starting, you know, just their day, just starting them doing their normal stuff, um, then your readers aren't going to be desperate to flip the pages. And like Bree said, you know, the whole point is to get the readers hooked. So they're just going to keep reading and reading and reading. So you want your first paragraph, especially to be your first line to lead into the second line to lead into the next to just keep going. So you really want to just make sure that you have it you have it active, um, you're grounding your readers, like I said before, um, and you hook them with your first page completely. You wanna be able to end the first page. When you're at a bookstore and you open the book and you see the first page, you want that last line to be what leads you on, keep moving. Cause that's gonna get your readers to pick up the book. Um, and also because Amazon will show the first few pages, um, you can preview books. You wanna make sure that, that those pages are what is gonna sell your book. And then I also mentioned show don't tell. I don't know if I need to explain that because everyone has heard that so many times. Um, but just make sure you show what's happening and just don't tell it to us. And I would say just if you're not sure what that is, that could take a whole nother webinar. So I would just go start doing research, look at some articles right now. Um, yeah. That's all. Yeah, no, we've got, uh, I think, a 40 minute. Uh, read see live so facebook live session from another one of our editors on just show don't tell so it can take a whole other webinar cool so now uh rebecca mentioned this already we're going to share just three uh novel openings for inspiration so um, again the point we made for the blurb take a look at the competition is valid here again take a look at other books in your genre if you're writing in a given genre you've probably read a lot in that genre so maybe reread those favorite books of yours and analyze their opening pages their first chapters um even their first lines and see what grabbed you uh and take inspiration from it so i'm sharing these three because simply they're short enough that they can fit on the slide um, and they also represent kind of different things. So, Rebecca, do you want to start with yours? Yes, I do. Um, so two of these are my recommendations, the first two, actually. So I wanted to note that um, these, these come from books that I've edited, and the only reason I mention this uh, is because I'm – super persnickety about the work that I take, right? Let's say I take about 40% of the work that comes across my desk. And these openings captured me. I always read five pages when I'm deciding whether or not to take on a project. And these openings captured my attention in a way that made me want to work on these books. Even though um, they may or may not have been in their final form when I saw them, these openings were what I saw. Um, so the first one is from, uh, the Alchemist of Loom, which is adult steampunk. And what I like so much about this opening is that um, it articulates the protagonist's powerful, self-assured, highly skilled, um, very unique, very genre-specific skill set. Um, you know, she's sort of hovering on this building about to commit a crime. And just the catalog of things that Ariana holds uh, is so fascinating to me. A bomb, three bullets, two refined daggers, a mental map of her heist, and a magic winch box. This has activated so much world building in such a short time. Um, you know, steampunk is very specific about world building, and so if I'm a steampunk reader and I'm looking um, to really immerse myself in um, a pre-electronic world, I know that I'm in really good hands with this author, just based on this first line. So that was really powerful for me. Um, the second one is uh, a book that 
uh, comes out next week from uh, Simon and Schuster Merit Press. And what the reason I chose this is because um, this is what we've been talking a little bit about environment and how your character's environment, like weather might not be interesting, but your character's environment is really important. So we have a plane that's circling and it's trapped in the air and that can't move forward, can't move backward, is totally suspended. And this ends up being a beautiful analogy for what is happening to our protagonist, who's a teenager. Um, and the journey of the book involves her sort of defying that holding pattern that her mother is keeping her in and moving you know, forward in a journey. So you see that this is a really unique usage of setting. 20,000 feet above McCarran International, our plane looped in a holding pattern of repeating ovals. Mom had locked herself inside the onboard bathroom. So I'm, I have conflict right away, sentence two. I understand that my protagonist is someone who still, you know, I, I, I feels contemporary and young, right? This, this person is saying, my mother was locked, right? Mom, it's very colloquial, it feels very young. And this sort of looping plane stuck in the air um, is, is really a hint to readers about what's to come. And so I think both of these are just extraordinarily well done. Of course, I'm totally biased. You should uh, go buy both of those books. Okay. <laughs> cool. More publicity for authors. Um, Giddy, you want to mention yours? Uh, yeah, I picked. You know, it's very popular book um, because I was going through a few different popular books, and I was surprised to see that not all of them I felt started in the best spot. Um, but I really felt that this one, even though we talked about mirrors earlier, this one is a really great start because of the world building. Um, it sets us up uh, to show us that something is not the way people expect it to be. Everything is different than, you know, a typical um, start of a YA novel. So it already shows us that there are limits to this world and it gives us some voice of our character um, because we're able to you know, see that it's tough. It's tough talking about this stuff um, out loud because I'm an editor, so I write all the time. So <laughs> most of my stuff is just better when I write it. But um, let's see. So I like this one because, well, I'll just read it. So there's a mirror in my house. It is behind a sliding panel in the hallway upstairs. I mean, right away, we're already seeing that this is not normal. Um, you're setting it up to show that there are rules to her life, specifically in her house, but also the whole world. Um, and once it goes to our faction allows me, then we know that we have started in something totally different. And so I love how it sets it up with the world building. It's really interesting if you kept going on this, um, on this first page because it's really great because she has a lot of relationship with her mom that's coming out. And then we slowly begin to see why this day is the day that we started the book. There, it wasn't, it didn't begin yesterday. It started on this day because this is the day that um, her life is about to change. And we learned that very quickly on the first page of the book. And, you know, Re Rebecca mentioned earlier, describing yourself in front of a mirror. And it's really great the way Veronica Roth does it because the way this character describes herself is very objective because she doesn't see herself that often. So she just kind of, it's, it's, it's like one line. It's just, um, I see a narrow face, round, wide round eyes and a long thin nose. And I look like a little girl though. Sometimes in the last, sometime in the last few months I turned 16. I mean, that's a great way to describe someone without getting into, oh, I see this about myself and all that. She's just like, this is my life. It's very different than what everyone else would expect. And I'm kind of just used to it. But you can, you can also get that tone of knowing that there's something else going on and that this character has some struggles with this. And so I think that's the great thing about this whole opening page because it sets a tone, it gives us our character, and it shows us what's different about this world and why we should read it. I want to... Um, jump in just to say I also thought about choosing this as as my uh, sort of winner winner chicken dinner opening because um, like Katie says it really inverts this sort of um, no no of, of describing the self but like the um, example from welcome to the slipstream 
what we're seeing when we zoom out and think about motifs and symbolism is that this person's identity is very much obscured. So in her physical environment, um, her identity, her physical self is hidden, right? Her ability to see herself is hidden. And so we know this story. Most people know this story now. It's about the revelation of identity. And so what Veronica has done is from the very first page, she's giving us a hint about the much larger mechanisms involved, not just in this book, but in the entire series about discovering identity. And so, you know, find that symbol in your book, find that image uh, that you don't need to sort of bash your readers over the head with it, but that's going to be meaningful and sets a really specific tone. There's a lot of tension in the lines here. They're short lines, uh, they're short sentences, they're highly um, utilitarian, right? Uh, they're, they're very specific, and all of that creates uh, tension around identity, and that's what this entire um, series was about. So I think this was just a great pick, Katie, and... Uh, and just a wonderful uh, example for people to think about, not just the language, but why the language speaks volumes about the book as a whole. And I would add, Rebecca, you mentioned tension. I think all three of these books, or these opening lines do that really well. We get a clear sense in just two or three sentences that um, there is a conflict coming up or a massive change or revolution happening in these characters' lives. So we, in this first one, there, there's weaponry and there's waiting. So there's a sense of aggression, but also passivity. And that's a tenseness. There, the second one, there is a circling of a plane. There is a holding feeling. There is a locked um, sense and, and that separation between these two characters who appear to be playing massive roles throughout the rest of the book. And the last one that identity um, and even if you don't catch that in those opening lines that there's something hidden there's something buried away there's a set of rules that puts the primary character um, back from herself that she's not allowed to do certain things so i think all of these do that really well in setting up the elements of the world the rules of the world and the tension that's going to play out for the remainder of the book Absolutely. And it's interesting because we're mentioning more or less the same things that um, you mentioned when we're talking about blurbs, main characters, uh, conflicts, tension. Um, so a lot of the same advice applies, even if we're talking about kind of the, the opening line and not the blurb uh, anymore. So we've shared, um, our editors have shared three novel opening um, three of their favorite novel openings. They've shared a lot more uh, with me. Uh, so if you've got a particular genre you're writing in or a particular novel, feel free to drop it in the, in the chat box uh, and maybe they'll be able to give you um, an example of another one of their favorite novel openings in your genre. So with that, we get to the questions. Uh, before uh, we jump into them and I kind of take a look at what you've been sharing uh, on YouTube, um, if you've got any questions after this webinar uh, or you want to get in touch with uh, the editors, feel free to drop me a line, ricardo at ritzy.com. And obviously, remember Sure Indie, the contest, and Sion, who's um, brought this webinar and who's encouraged us to put all this together. Um, Sion, do you want to mention it again when it starts, how it works? Uh, yeah, the contest, the submission period is um, June 3rd to 5th, and uh, authors who have a young adult, new adult, or, an, or adult novel or novella are encouraged to submit. Um, we have 10 editors on board. Um, each submission, you can submit to up to three editors. There is a small submission fee, $5 to help costs, um, but it's from our participation in other contests like this, it's well worth it. It's a great learning experience for everybody. Um, the editors will be each choosing one person to work with for free for seven weeks. And then those 10 authors from round one will go on to the judging round. And actually, Elise Kova, who wrote Alchemists of Loom, is one of our judges. Very excited to have her. Um, and the judges, the three judges, will work together to choose a grand prize winner and a runner-up. And um, yeah, you see the the uh, address there on the screen. It's sureindie.blogspot.com, and you can find out more. 
Awesome. And I guess kind of the blurb and the opening lights of the novel are going to be very important for this contest, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Thanks for helping me like make that cover that connection. Uh, that is what people will be submitting. They will be submitting their back cover copy and the first five pages of their book. Cool. So I'm glad we did this webinar. Uh, so if you found it helpful, uh, make sure that you revise it according to the tips uh, we all shared in this webinar and uh, that you then enter the contest. So now I'm going to take a look at any questions that we got during the chat. I don't think we got all too many questions. That's uh, what happens when you when we do a webinar on Saturday. But again, if you've been listening to this, you can drop me a line record at rt.com with any questions, and I'll just like give them to um, our editors, and we can answer by e email. Uh, just one question from Romilo: Not all books can or should start with a chase or fight. How to make a soft start more engaging? Who wants to take this one? Uh, I'll, I'll talk about it. So can you just repeat the first part of that question? Was it about, um, by soft start, is this person asking how to start a book without a chasing? Yeah, how to make a soft start more engaging. Basically, I think this author doesn't want to start with a chase or a fight or by action sure, like that. Sure. You know, it's funny because I have actually never been part of a car chase, but I consider my life relatively interesting. So I think uh, one of the keys here is to remember that when we say begin with an explosive action, we don't mean actual explosions. Um, I mean, you can, sure, if that's your genre. Um, the point is well taken. How do you create uh, something dynamic out of a quiet moment? I think number one, Get the the Diana Gabaldon book I recommended. I give you my body. Learn about the rule of three. Learn about how to make a sensory environment dynamic and present and immediate. Um, you know, you have to open with conflict. It doesn't have to be the conflict of being chased. It doesn't have to be the conflict of potentially being shot. It just has to be, um, you know, real bona fide conflict. And of course, we could do a whole other webinar about what that really means. But by and large, I encourage you to, um, you know, help us understand why your protagonist's experience is meaningful and where it might be tense. Um, so, you know, it's actually not as sort of ambiguous and vague as it sounds. Uh, really look at what is at stake for your protagonist and start there. I think so many authors instinctively try to build identities and build worlds before they actually get going with conflict. And think about yourself as a reader. Like, do you require a lot of handholding when you read a book? Or can you kind of figure it out based on things like, hey, you read the description and it has a cover and it has a certain feel and it has a certain typeface and a certain organization. So your reader isn't coming into chapter one blind to what your book is. You've already signaled with so many other um, with so many other things what your book is. So it's okay to just dig your feet into sort of the mud and really get into your core conflict right away. So uh, explosions you need not, conflict you need. Perfect. I like this uh, this closing sentence. So now we've got another question um, maybe for Brie. Generally, how many words is a blurb? That's a really good question. So I generally suggest about 100 to 150 max for your book blurb. And that should give you enough space to kind of outline the themes and tropes in your book, what the sort of general setting and genre is, your primary character or protagonist, and then what that conflict is that the reader will be exploring as they read your book. Perfect. And also, again, take a look at the competition, all their, all their books uh, in your genre on Amazon, see how the blurbs are structured, uh, how long they are, and try to mirror that, if it makes sense. Exactly. Cool. So I don't think we have any more questions. So I'll just invite everyone um, on this call to, to share maybe final thoughts, long or short, um, up to you. 
uh, and then we'll close this webinar. So do you want to start, Rebecca? Always. Uh, I always want to start. <laughs> um, I think there is a well-known writer's adage that says the first draft is about the author and every subsequent draft is about the reader. And I think this is quite true. Um, I think a writer can create many first drafts of the same book. So what I mean to say is when you start to get to a place where your plot is dynamic, your conflicts are real, you're getting some positive feedback from beta readers, you really need to start thinking about who your reader is and what is attractive to them because you don't write in a vacuum and you certainly don't sell your writing in a vacuum. So, um, you know, once you feel comfortable with your responsibilities as the author of a story, it's time to get comfortable with your responsibilities as the marketer of that story. And your blurb uh, has a lot to do with that. Excellent. Um, Bree, do you want to go next? Yes, I love that you said that, Rebecca, because that is so true. One of the, <laughs> one of the um, really challenging parts um, for authors is sometimes to recognize when you're um, done writing and when you're sort of transitioning into a marketing lens, and it's in some ways kind of a change of hats, because you do need to look at it from a different perspective. And one thing that I find that really helps and that I do with every client that I work with is called an OPR, and I call it your one perfect reader. So that just takes some time to sit down and consider who is this book, book for? Give them a name. What is their personality? What are their demographics? How are they looking for your book? What's going to spark their interest and encourage them to connect with you as an author and with your characters? Because once you can get a sense of their mind frame of that one perfect reader, you can start looking at your book from their perspective. And then when you start to put on your marketing hat and Start writing first drafts of your book blurb and look at your actual content, the beginning pages of your book from that perspective, you can find some opportunities to make changes, to work with your editor. And so having that uh, sort of transition and or that paradigm is, is really important. And I think the second thing I'll say is a little bit more of a sort of nitty gritty um, suggestion. When you are doing that initial research, if you're already um, a published author, a great way to get started at looking at your competitive authors and titles from Amazon's perspective is to look at who they recommend on your author central page. So once you're on that page, if you have it created, you can scroll down and get a sense of who the other authors or similar authors are. And that is generally based on who's selling similar to you, who's writing in similar genres to you, and who is approaching some of the same readers as you. And that's a really great place to start and look at how are they structuring their blurbs? Are they using questions? Are they using reviews? Are they using unique language? Do they have keywords? Does it relate to the setting? And once you get a really good amount of data around that, once you've done your research, then you can then go back again and look at your own blurb and say, where can I add in more keywords? Where's a way to transition some of the perspectives if that relates back to your book? And where can you add in some of those changes that you've been noticing when you put your marketing hat on? Oh, sorry, I was muted. Uh, so <laughs> thanks for this final thought. Um, Katie, do you want to share yours? Sure. Um, a, lot is, a lot of good stuff has been said already. Um, I'll kind of just bounce off of it. Um, we want to, you know, when you're trying to write your blurb, um, kind of what has already been said, but look at it from the buyer's perspective if you can. I mean, consider when you're book shopping, um, what do you look for when you pick up a book? And so if you're, it's hard to be objective for your own work, but if you're able to look at yours or look at other people's and maybe jot down, I mean, when you go to a bookstore just for, you know, experience, try and just go to a bookstore. Um, cause I imagine you are at a bookstore pretty often as an author already and just go in without an idea of what sort of book you want. Just start going through the aisles, pick up a few that catch your eye, and read the blurbs, read the first pages, and think about, you know, is this something that you would want to keep reading? And make note of all the things that you go through as a book buyer, and then go back to your work and try and apply it to your own stuff. Because, you know, you have to reach out to your 
readers. This, like Rebecca said, this book, the first draft was for you, but the every draft after is for your readers. So you want to consider what your book is doing for your reader. Um, what is your reader going to get out of it? Why would they want to read it? And since you do the same thing yourself when you are shopping as well, you can experience that feeling and you can try to apply it to your own work. And then also, of course, you know, beta readers and critique partners, um, all of that is super helpful because you could just go to a critique group, you know, go to an in-person group or online and just test out your blurbs or your first pages and ask specific questions, you know, do they relate to the character? What do they feel when, with the story? Would they want to keep reading? Um, also consider that's the same stuff that people, um, when you enter a contest, um, a lot of times it's just the first few pages. So the judges are wondering if they want to keep reading. You know, the whole time they're judging a, a contest, they're thinking, well, I want to keep reading this. So that's what you want to be thinking for your own work. Would people want to keep reading this? Um, that's all. Again, always forgetting to unmute me myself. Okay, cool. Uh, thanks so much for all your thoughts. Uh, thanks to uh, all the people who've been watching this live. Uh, again, I'll make the replay available to everyone. I'll make the slides available as well. Um, thanks so much, uh, Brie, Rebecca, Katie, for uh, coming in and uh, sharing your thoughts, your experiences, and your advice on, on blurbs and uh, novel openings. I've learned a lot. Uh, and I think it's on a topic like this, it's been really cool to be able to have both the craft perspective, the editor's perspective, and also a marketing perspective. And we've seen that kind of uh, both go together um, and both uh, go around, how do I make sure that the readers who come across my book page on Amazon and who open my novel are going to like it? Um, so think about your reader, if there's one takeaway for today. Um, and again, thanks for tuning in, and have a good day. Thank you so